over the past couple of weeks, there have been a couple of things that has been on my mind. And I know that again, Thanksgiving well, is about a week and a half away, but the Thanksgiving meal has not been what has been on my mind for the past couple of weeks. For the past couple of weeks, the two things that have been on my mind is first, God. God is always on, on my mind. And when we, when we get to this time of year, I'm always thankful that I have made it this far in the year. And so I'm always thankful. I'm always just grateful for all that God has, all that he has done for me. The second thing that has been on my mind for the past couple of weeks has been family. Family, the idea of a family. The idea of family is love. The idea of family is that tight bun, that togetherness, that, that unity, that fellowship. That's what's been on my mind for the past couple of weeks now. Faith, fellowship. It's been on my mind, and I would hope that at the end of, of this message today, that faith and fellowship will be on your minds because I believe that we are living in a season to where faith and fellowship needs to be on our mind. I believe that we are living in a season to where faith and fellowship must be on our minds today. Now, the reason why I say that is because God has spoken. God has spoken. That is why I am saying today that faith and fellowship needs to be on our mind. God has spoken. God, he, he first spoke through, through the prophets. He relayed his word to the prophets and then the prophets, they would take his word to the people. But the people, when they would disobey, God would have to get through to them another way. And so we know that God, he gave the world his only begotten son who came to this world, who preached in this world, who preached that we need to turn to God, that we need to turn away from sin. And today, God, he is still speaking to the world. He speaks to the world today through his stewards, through, through his representatives that should be all of his children. We are supposed to be stewards of the Lord. We are supposed to be representatives of God. We are all supposed to be ministers of the Lord. But again, we live today in a world that was like yesterday. To where the people, they disregarded the word of the prophets. They did not believe it. And so God had to send his only begotten son because the people they did not regard the prophets. Today, people aren't regarding his stewards. Today, people are ignoring his representatives. And so God has spoken. And he has, I want you to understand today, he has spoken in a manner that should not be ignored. If you turn with me and you take a look at the 12th chapter of the book of, or the epistle to the Hebrews, and you take a look at the 25th and the 26th verse, you will see that the Lord, when his people chooses not to listen to him, that God will speak in a manner that should not be ignored. We are told in the 12th chapter of Hebrews in the 25th and the 26th verse, the scripture, it states there, see that you do not refuse him who speaks the him who speaks. That's being referenced. There is the Lord. Do not refuse him. Do not refuse God who speaks, whose voice then talking about the past 
shook the earth. God, he has shook the earth once before. He, he has caused some things to get out of order at times. When he sent his only begotten son, it upset, it upset some things. The religious leaders, let's remember, they were upset. When, when Jesus stood before them and said, whoa, hypocrites. We'll see there, still looking at that scripture there that the scripture says, but now he has promised saying, yes, once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven yet once more. I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. God, he has sent a message today and he has shook up the world in the message that he has sent. He has upset some things, some things that have occurred. They don't seem to be orderly as we would think they should be. You see, he has rocked this, this earth today. And, and I would tell you that it didn't begin just a couple of weeks ago. There, there is not one thing that happens in the world today that God is not aware of that God has not permitted or allowed to happen. Everything happens for a purpose. Everything happens for a reason. As my dad would tell you, if he were still alive today, there is no such thing as coincidence when it comes to God. God has spoken. You see, God, Recently, he's been trying to get our attention by all kinds of means, but we aren't paying attention. You see, it began when school kids would take guns to school and shoot up other kids. It continued when unarmed people would be killed by those who are meant to protect and serve. Men began to walk through the streets, carrying torches, shouting out all hateful phrases of speech that we thought were, were years behind us. Little did we know. Even the weather nowadays, we would say acts kind of strange. We, we had a hurricane about a month ago, and I was telling my mom this when I was looking at the hurricane. I was saying to her, we don't typically see hurricanes move in the direction that it moves coming off the Gulf like that. Nobody seemed to make a big deal about it, but it was something that caught my eye. Today we see liars. We see bigots. We see racists, misogynists, false teachers, false leaders. We see them out in the open. They don't hide themselves anymore. If you catch my drift, they're out in the open. They're loud. They are proud in their hateful way. And, and to show you just how much trouble we're in to show you why God is shaking up the earth today. Hate is being supported today in large numbers. Let me tell you something. We are in trouble today. I was told that, that things like slavery and oppression, that things like Jim Crow and, and unequal rights. I was told those things are in the past. That they, that they far behind us. But, but, but God again is speaking today. And, and I want you to understand today that God is speaking today, not in that still small voice. God again has shook the earth. Are you paying attention today? You see, we must pay attention to, to God's voice today. He is speaking. We must see that he is speaking. We must see the message. We must receive the message. And then we must move accordingly today. You see the message 
that's been sent today is that it's time for us to remember how we were raised, to remember how we were brought up, to remember how we were trained to go in the way of God and to do so not separately, not apart, but together. The message that was sent is that we are a community. We, us, we are a community that needs to return to its old ways of faith and fellowship, togetherness. The message that's been sent is that we need to embrace each other more than we have been doing. Yes, we may be close, but we need to get closer today. So I say to you today, if you don't have a church home, you need to find a church home today. You need to find a church home that again lives by the word of God that teaches the sound doctrine of Christ. We know somebody who may not be in attendance today. If you do not attend church regularly today, when you once did, it's time for you to get back into the church. It's time for us to worship together. It's time for us to fellowship together. Us. We need to return back to our roots today. If you have lost contact with family, friends, and, and loved ones, I tell you, now is the season to where you need to reestablish those connections. And the reason why that is, is because we need each other. You see, we're told there in that 12th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, in the 27th verse, that the shaking once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. And then we're told that in the 28th verse, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. The kingdom that cannot be shaken is, is the kingdom that is at hand. The kingdom that is at hand is the kingdom of God. We are receiving that kingdom if we are of sincere faith. And if we are of sincere faith, even though the Lord is permitting the world to be rocked and shook today, if we are of faith, we cannot be shook. I want you to understand there. And so again, the scripture says there, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We must move together today and we must move together today by faith and fellowship that is rooted in Christ Jesus to again withstand the shaking of the world today. We need to again move together. We must move together in faith and fellowship because there's also again, an evil that is present and moving in the world today. There is an evil and a spirit of division that is moving in the world today. And it is trying to penetrate into our community and it is trying to divide us. And Jesus, he has told us that every kingdom that is divided against itself will be brought to desolation. Jesus, he has told us that every city, every house that is divided against itself, Jesus has told us that it will not stand. We must come together together. Today, I want you to understand today, there has been no kingdom, there has been no city, there has been no house that's been divided against itself that has not fallen. So we ought not be so proud today to think that somehow we can buck the trend of history, that, that somehow we can buck the word of God. Because again, as we have seen recently, 
we know that pride goes before destruction and that a haughty spirit goes before a fall. We must come together today. If you turn with me over to the fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes and the ninth verse, we'll see that there is a reward for, for our being able to come together in faith and in fellowship. In the fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes and the ninth verse, the scripture tells us two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls is what the scripture says there. You see, there is power when this community stands together. There is power when we stand together. There is power when we worship together. There is power when we pray together. There is power when we fellowship together. There is power when we move together. And so we are told in scripture that, that when we come together, that we are able to stir up love, that we are able to stir up good works, that we are able to exhort each other in times of trouble. So again, we must come together today because once again, we are better together than we are apart. And, and the word of God makes this very clear for us today. This is not simply a phrase that we have come up with, but it is a phrase that is based on sound doctrine. You see, none of us can build a house apart. I wouldn't even know where to begin. I would need help to be able to build a house. And so when we come together, we can build not only a house together, but we can build many houses together. We are again able to uplift one another. We are able to help each other. We are able to teach each other. We are able to learn from each other. When we come together, when we come together, we are able to lift each other up to new heights and not be brought down because once again, we stand together. And when we stand together, there is nothing that can defeat us. Let me tell you something in our history. We are undefeated. No matter how much people have tried to bring us down, we still stand here today because we stood together. You see, those that came before us, they understood very well that it takes a village. So why have we gotten away from that way of thinking that it takes a village? It takes a village for us to make it. So what does it take for us as a community today to be able to draw closer together in faith and in fellowship? What does it take for us to come together, united on one accord for, for a singular goal to be able to flourish and to be able to prosper? Well, we take a look there at the second chapter of Philippians. We'll see there in the third verse there, that Paul, he wrote, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. You see, I believe that selfish ambition, and I believe that conceit is where, where we went wrong. I believe that that selfish ambition and conceit is where, where many of us, where we have, where we have strayed away from, from the community. And I believe that selfish ambition, and I believe that conceit that is that is slowly beginning to kill our community 
that is starting to kill what makes us strong. It's starting to kill our fellowship together. You see, at one point in time, we recognized that we were all that we had. But over time, we, we learned from the way of evil man, didn't we? And we began to have a desire to, to be like them. We, we, we began to have a desire to be like them. We, we began to, to buy into their teachings. We, we began to buy into their way of greed. We, we began to buy into their way of, of covetousness rather than in the way of God's teaching, in the way of God's love. We were once united together in the teachings of God. We moved together in the teachings of God. We moved together in the love of God, but we strayed away from that. For greed and for covetousness. For again, selfish ambition. And when we began to move out of evil man's greed, when we began to move out of evil man's covetousness, contempt, for those in our community began to grow within us. I'm going to make some folks upset today. I get it. That's all right. We need this truth today. I want you to understand that that, that way, that greed, that covetousness, that, that, that contempt, that's what the evil man desires. Because that contempt for, for each other is what divides us. And you see, we are stronger together in numbers. But when you divide us apart, the enemy can easily devour and defeat us. See, where we used to work together, we began to, and we still do, we compete against each other. What good has come from, from competing against each other in a manner where only one succeeds and the other is left behind? What good has come from it when one has all the riches of this world and the others are left behind with a hand held out? You see, it's okay for us to compete against each other if we are competing each, against each other to build each other up. That's fine. When, when, when I'm racing against you and you're racing against me and we're both just trying to, to increase our speed, when I'm lifting weights with you and you're lifting weights with me and, and we're trying to compete to see who can lift more, if we are building each up, the other up to lift more and more, that's good. But, but when we move in a manner to where I have to have this business and you can't have a business at all, we are in trouble. We, we, we are then doing exactly what the enemy wants us to do. And I'm telling y'all today, we are better together than we are apart. Now watch us as a community today where we will overcharge each other. Well, we will rob from each other because all we see are the dollar signs. We, we stop seeing each other. For, for the wealth and for the riches of this world, that's a problem. We will move against each other over some dead presidents on green paper. Some presidents that didn't even like you. Uh-oh. But, but, but we fight over each other for that green piece of paper, an inanimate object. It doesn't do anything, but we show enough a fight over it. Why do we fight each other over, over that green piece of paper? What, to whine and to dine? To have more than everybody else? To show off? There go that conceitedness. What's even worse is that in our, in, in our contempt for, for one another, we, we have developed this, this sort of disrespect of one another. 
where we don't respect each other anymore. Something as simple as respecting each other's time, we don't do that. We laugh and we joke about it. We don't respect what each other is going through nowadays. We don't respect each other's gifts. We don't respect each other's skills. We'll go out and we'll pay somebody else. But when it comes to folks we know, tell me I'm lying. We're going to try to get over on them. We, we try to cheat each other. Is that right? I want you to understand today, I'm not saying these things to be mean-spirited. I'm saying these things to point out that we can't move together if selfishness is what lies within us. We, we can't move together if contempt is what lies within us. So as Paul stated there in that scripture there, in order for us to move together, we need to turn away from selfish ambition. We need to turn away from, from selfishness. In order for us to move together, we must become selfless. We must become selfless, loving each other, respecting each other. We need to get back to that place because our parents understood it. Our grandparents understood it. Our great grandparents understood it. So why don't we understand it today? And, and when I say we, I'm not necessarily talking to all y'all that got the gray hair because y'all, y'all raised us to be better than what we are today. So when I'm saying us, I'm talking about Gen X. I'm talking about us millennials. All of them, them ones that's coming after us, I'm talking to them as well. We have to do better than what we are doing. Somebody going to say, Pastor, no, we're still close. What I'm saying to you today is that in this season, we need to get closer together. We need to be closer than what we are today. Because I'm telling you now, the enemy is out there. The spirit of division is out there and he seeks to divide, to conquer. You see, it is war for that, that evil, that wickedness. It's war for them. And if it's war for them, it has to be the same for us. We are in a spiritual warfare today. I don't know if you hear me here. And so when we take a look at the third and the fourth verse there, on, on this note of, of becoming more selfless, we'll see there that Paul, he wrote in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each esteem others, lift others up, esteem others better than himself. He said, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Look at this statement here. This is a statement here that speaks about love in its purest form. This is a statement here from Paul that speaks about love in its, in its true form. You see, in its purest, and in this true form, love, as we should know and understand today, it does not seek its own. You see, in its purest and in its truest form, love, it will put others before itself. How many of us putting others before ourselves today? You see, we cannot move together if we're always putting ourselves before others. Always trying to beat somebody else to the finish line when we should all be all be trying to cross that finish line together, shouldn't we? Yeah. Trying to beat somebody else to to the prize when when all of us we should be trying to get to that prize all together at the same time, so that all of us can have the same joy, right? Is it really joy when you're standing there all by yourself? You see, the mindset of love is that of lowliness, humility, 
service of, of each other. That's supposed to be the mindset of love. The mindset of love is not me, me, me. I, I, I. That is not the mindset of love. You see, Jesus, he showed the disciples, he showed us the mindset of love when, when Jesus, when he sat down and when he washed the disciples' feet. Jesus, he told the disciples, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. How many of us are washing each other's feet today? We don't want to look at nobody's feet, do we? See, see we ain't going to wash nobody's feet, but we certainly going to want our feet washed, aren't we? And understand, I'm talking figuratively right now. We, we're not going to serve somebody else, but you better believe that, that we want to be served, that we want to be wine and dined. We want the waiter and the waitresses to come and to wait on us, but we're not going to turn around and play the role of waiting on somebody else. Because once again, it's all about me. We must keep in mind today that, again, love is not puffed up. Some of us, we are so conceited in our way to where we won't even bother helping our loved ones, our own flesh and blood. And if we won't help our own flesh and blood, if we won't lift up our own flesh and blood, how in the world, how in the world are we going to help lift up a community? It's really a shame that God has to remind us over and over and over and over again to love one another. It seems everywhere you turn through scripture, we are told over and over and over again, love, 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 love. And, and it's honestly a shame because he created us not to be angry beings. He didn't create us to be bitter beings. He created us to be loving beings. Beings of peace, beings of being a blessing in this world. Again, God created us to flourish, to be fruitful and to prosper. That's what we were created in, in his image and in his likeness. If we're going to flourish, it will be because we understand that flourishing is a community effort. It's not a one person effort and it's not a one group kind of effort. It takes a village. It takes everybody. And so with this in mind, we'll see there in the 14th verse that Paul, he wrote, do all things without complaining and disputing. Do all things, Paul said there, without complaining and disputing. You see, it's hard for us to be able to work with somebody if all they do is fuss, fight, argue, and complain. You, you can't work with that kind of person, can you? you know? There are a lot of people today that, that love to fuss, fight, argue, and complain. They love to dispute. Why is that? See, the source of a lot of fussing and fighting, it comes from that prideful nature that has worked its way into mankind. That prideful nature of, of always thinking, I'm right and everybody else is stupid. I'm wise, everybody else is a fool. I know everything and everybody else is dumb. God didn't create us to be that way again. But that's what's the source of a lot of fussing and fighting and arguing and, and complaining. That prideful nature, that conceited nature, that self-righteous nature that lies in the hearts of a many today. For example, parents can tell their know-it-all children what not to do and that child, that teen, going to feel a certain kind of way. Because that teen already know, hey, I know everything. My parents don't know anything. We would have once, weren't we? We had the audacity to tell mama and dad, oh, I ain't paying no attention to that. 
older brother may try to tell younger brother what they shouldn't do. And, and younger brother going to look at older brother like he crazy. Y'all going to feel a certain kind of way when somebody try to tell us something because we know better, don't we? That happens in marriages. It happens in relationships. Pride and stubbornness, right? Such a mindset, I want you to understand today, that it closes up our ears. It, it closes up one's ears to where they won't listen. We aren't listening today. If we aren't listening to God when he has shook the earth, we certainly aren't listening to each other. And so when we aren't listening to one another, does it help us to be able to move together? No, we, we can't move together. So we have to go about trying to remove all this fussing and this fighting and this arguing that we, that we do in our community today so that we can grow together, so that we can work together. So how do we go about removing all the fussing and the fighting that, that you know that we can do. Because some of us, we just love to have that, that fight, don't we? How do we go about removing it from us? To answer that, I'll reference what James said over in the first chapter of James in the 19th and the 20th verse. James, he wrote, let every man be swift to hear. James, he wrote that, let every man to be slow to speak. Listen to that. Swift to hear, but slow to speak. James, he did say it there as well. Let every man be slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We today, we, we must learn to, to listen, to learn. We, we, we must learn to, to listen, to grow. You see, life's not always about who is always right. You hear me? See, that, that kind of mindset, it gets us nowhere. That's what's actually stalled out the, the, the growth in the church today. We stop listening because our way is always the best way. Your way is not. We stop listening to learn. That's why our community isn't flourishing the way that it potentially could. Because again, my way is better than your way. We must come to understand that everybody doesn't think or move the same way that, that we do. Did you hear me there? We, we must come to, to understand that everybody isn't like, like I am or like you are. We are all different. We must come to understand that none of us are perfect. We aren't perfect. We aren't always right. In order for us to flourish together, to help and to support each other, I want you to understand today that listening is required. It is a requirement. You see, I must listen to you to try to understand you. You must listen to me to understand me. The problem that we have today is that we live today by preconceived judgments of each other. And history has shown us that preconceived judgments gets a community nowhere. Think about our history. We have a history of, of being marginalized because of what people thought about people who look like us, who, who have a, a colored skin. I love my chocolate skin, but I ain't dumb because of my chocolate skin. We are a marginalized community still to this day because people look at us 
and judge us without getting to know us. And then what's worse is we will turn around and we will do the same thing to us. There are many people today that think that we are ignorant because of the color of our skin. No matter how many college degrees we have, no matter the experience that we have, because our hair may get a little nappy, may not be as straight as, as other folks have, we are fool. Is that the right way to think? We must work to get on one accord today. If we don't work to get on one accord today, let me tell you something, we will fall. We must work today to get on one accord and we can do that by listening to each other, by getting to understand each other. We can get on one accord. And being on one accord is what God desires. It is what the spirit desires. That's the goal of the spirit for us to come together, to worship together, to fellowship together, and to then move together by that faith and by that fellowship. Take a look at the first and the second uh, verse there in the, in the second chapter of Philippians. We'll see that Paul, he wrote, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like minded, have the same love being of one accord of one mind, Paul said there. That's a word that's very similar to what Paul wrote over in the 12th chapter of Romans in the ninth and the 10th verse where Paul wrote, let love be without hypocrisy. That selfish ambition and that conceitedness, that, that bitterness and that hatred that, that drives us apart. Paul said, let love be without that mess. Paul, he said, abhor what is evil and, and cling to what is good in that scripture in the 12th chapter of Romans. Again, I repeat to you today that selfishness, that the greediness and that the conceited nature that is developed in the hearts of, of many of us today, that that moves against progress. It moves against love and it should not be in us. If we desire to prosper and flourish today as a community, we must abhor it. To abhor evil means to loathe and to detest it to loathe and to detest sin and any and all unrighteousness. We are supposed to be friends with it. True love, let's keep in mind today that it does not think any evil. And if it doesn't think any evil, it certainly ain't moving out of evil. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. You see, again, I want you to hear this today. I can't be on accord with you if love is not in your nature. If, if you're moving out of bitterness and if you're moving out of hatred, I can't be on the same page with you because I'm on the page that's moving out of love, that's moving out of togetherness, that's moving out of faith and that's moving out of fellowship. I can't be on the same wavelength with you. You're on a completely different wave than I am. As young folks say, you're on a completely different vibe than I am. I don't vibe with that. I don't get down with that. You see, we can't be on one accord if you, if you support the way of wickedness, if you support the way of evil. To be crystal clear here, if you're out here in the world today and you're supporting racism, if you're supporting bigotry, misogyny, if you're behind that, if that's what you're getting down with today, if, you, if you're supporting all manner of hate, hate speech, 
lies and deception. If that's what you are on today, if that's what you are with today, I ain't with you. And I'm not going to let you get next to me. Jesus, he warned about that, that sheep that comes, that wolf that's coming in sheep clothing. He warned about that. You got a lot of folks that done did wrong today saying, oh, no, you shouldn't judge me about that. We can still be friends. No, we can't. We're on a different page. In order for us to get on the same page, you need to repent today to get on the page that I am on. Again, Paul said that we are to cling to what is good, not what is wicked. To cling means to hold together, to adhere as if glued firmly, to hold or hold on tightly or tenaciously. You see, the wicked and the evil, they don't want us to cling together today. They always got something to say, don't they? They want us to be so divided. And you know why that is? It's because they know that when we are working together, when we are moving together, they know that we can't be beat. History shows that this community is undefeated when we are all on one accord. We as a community, we get things done. When brothers are supporting brothers and sisters are supporting sisters and when brothers and sisters are supporting each other, we are a community that gets things done. You see, we have withstood all the, the, the spite of the bigots and, and the racist. We have withstood it. All manner of hate and evil, we have withstood it. And we'll do it again today. So to those who may be hurting today, those who may be lost today, dealing with depression. I tell you today that there is hope. There is still, there is always hope. We have hope in the Lord. And then in faith and fellowship, we have hope in each other. We just have to get back to that place today. So let us come together today of one mind and of one accord with one goal in sight. And the goal that should be in sight today is for us to flourish. And in order for us to flourish, we must love each other. We must help support and uplift each other. We need to put our selfish ambition to the side. In fact, we need to throw it all the way back there behind us and never look back at it again. And we need to be selfless in our way looking out for the interests of each other, and I must put you before me, and the same goes for you. And when we do that, we will succeed. We will have a reward, not simply in this world, we will have a greater reward, a greater reward that's in the kingdom of heaven. It takes a village. In this village, we can save lives. We can flourish and we can prosper. We just have to set our minds to do that. Will you do that today? Will you join in with me in doing that today? I certainly hope that you will. Amen. 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 Amen.